Okay, so this is lecture 26 of ECE 503. So this lecture, what we're going to do is we're going to continue from lecture 25 and go into more the details. We kind of already graphically showed how this would work <coughs> in terms of sampling rate conversion. If you have an I and a D factor, you have a low-pass filter that you're going to need to design, and you have data which you need to be wary about in terms of, wary sounds negative, you have to be cognizant about in terms of its characteristics. Okay, so last class, we saw the decimator. Decimator sounds like a very negative word, doesn't it? But the decimator and the interpolator. So the decimator, you have a filter, probably low pass. It limits the signal to prevent it from aliasing, and then you decimate it. You downsample it, and what that does spectrally is it expands the signal. The interpolator is the very opposite procedure. It compresses the spectrum, and you take a replica, one of the replicas, using the low-pass filter. So what we saw last class is you combine the two together to create a sampling rate converter. Right? So look at the frequency response. Suppose you have a signal, you low-pass filter it, you get this little house-looking thing, you downsample by a certain factor, and it widens now from minus pi to pi. The interpolator, it compresses your spectrum, let's say by a factor of i, you have periodic replicas, and your filter takes out one of the replicas. So if you have them back to back, you get that guy on top there. What's really cool, and I do mean it, is nothing stops you from moving the i or the d thing. You know, the down sampler and the up sampler to opposite sides of the filter. You can actually move one to the other side or the other to the other side. And it's going to modify your low pass filter. It's really cool. So let's look at this. So we call this, you know, if we want to move the I to the right side, we want to move this D, the down arrow D, to the left side. H of K gets modified in the process, but it's doable, and we call it a polyphase filter structure. So let's look at that. So, what is polyphase? So first of all, you take your FIR filter. What you do is you take your FIR filter, you have its coefficients, you have the delay elements, yada, 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 and then... What you do is you reorganize everything. So what you do now is you group everything according to, let's say you have Z0, and then you go, like let's say you want uh, something that's like in M time units, right? You have Z0, then the next guy is ZM, then the next guy is Z minus 2M, Z minus 3M, Z minus 4M, then the next guy is shifted by one factor, and so on. So actually, let me, let me draw that. Okay. Aye. So what's this? So h of 0, z to the minus 0, plus 0, doesn't matter. Then you have h of 1 z to the minus 1 plus h of 2, z to the minus 2 plus h of 3, z to the minus 3, da, 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 da. What we want to do is we want to reorg. That's, that's a bad word in industry. So we want to restructure it. Let's, let, that's a nicer, slightly nicer term. Okay. We have to lay off this segment of coefficients. We're really sorry. Sorry, that's really bad. So what happens is you do the following. You have h of 0, z to the minus 0. Then what you do is, let's say you want something, you'll see the method behind my madness in a little bit. Let's say we take every mth sample. So we're restructuring everything. Okay. 
And we continuously do that. So what we're essentially doing is we're saying, OK, we take this term. Now, let's select m terms away, the next guy, right? And so on. And then we start with the second line. We do the same thing. We take this guy, m terms away, we select the next guy. Then m terms away, we take the next guy. And then we continuously do that, OK? I think everyone gets my point. So now we're setting this stage for something really cool. So we got that structure. Keep. Full screen mode. And so now what we want to do is we group these guys into these clusters. And what we got, suppose we have this structure. We're going to call each one of these groupings, we're going to call it p0 of z, p1 of z, all the way to pm minus 1 z. So what we're doing is we're grouping these guys together. We're creating, instead of h of z's, we have these individual components when summed together give us, give us h of z. We're going to rewrite this now. And what we're going to do is we're, we can extract z minus 1, z minus 2, all the way to z minus m minus 1, such that we have h0 plus hm minus m, blah, 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 blah. And notice now we have the same thing, z to the minus m, z to the minus m, but the coefficients are different. So what I've just done is I have z to the 0, z to the minus m, z to the minus 2m, minus 3m, minus 4m, for all of them. And the difference, that z term, that offset, I pull it out. So now what I've got is h of z, z to the minus i in this polynomial, right? This is the polyphase contribution. That's a polyphase component. And this generates h of z. And from this formulation, what happens when I sum? I sum. I do not multiply. What happens when I sum these p of z's? Graphically, what does this look like? The system h of z looks like a parallel realization of these polyphase components, right? Remember that? Let's, let, this is what it will look like. If we do that, so this guy here, he's going to be p0 of z. This guy here, he's going to be z to the minus 1, p1 of z. This guy here is going to be z to the minus 2, p2 of z, right? All the way down to the last guy, which is going to be z to the minus m minus 1, p m minus 1 z. And so this will graphically look like we're going to have your p 0 of z, p 1 of z, all the way to p m minus 1 of z. I'm sorry, it's, it is sloppy. <sighs> and then we have one guy, he's delayed by an element, goes there, delayed by an element, goes there, da, 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 da. delayed by an element, goes there. And then all these guys are summed together, sorry, summed together. And so what we have is this parallel realization. Okay, And what's really cool is if we set this up, it has some very powerful properties with respect to sampling con rate conversion. Let's keep this. So what do we get? So what ends up happening, so we have this guy. Oh, I forgot. So what happens is 
we have this polyphase representation, and I'm, I'm sorry, I did forget the z to the, to the m. So that should be in there too. Actually, no. I take that back. No, no, that's correct. So yeah, I am subsampling by. So so yeah, because I'm interpolating, I'm only taking the H0, the HM, the H2M, the H3M term. I'm interpolating, so that is correct. So it should be should be z to the m, z to the m terms. My my mistake. So what ends up happening is if we have this formulation, this is what I drew, right? So we call this a polyphase representation. So instead of h of n, now what I've done is I've have I have three filters. They're one m the size, right? They have one m the coefficients. They're operating in parallel. They have a delay line. And they're equivalent to h of z. Now, what's really cool is we can use something called the noble identities. So what happens is we use noble identity 1 and 2. So if I downsample followed by a filter, this is equivalent, equivalent to filtering with z to the d. So, uh, so it's like interpolating that system and then downsampling afterwards, right? So what we're doing is we're converting the frequency response of our system to interpolate and then downsample it. That's noble identity number one. Noble identity number two is I filter then upsample. Instead, this is equivalent to, again, if I move the upsampling first and then I have the filter, I'm upsampling and then I'm using the upsampled version of the filter in order to achieve the same operation. So this is really cool stuff. So where this has come in useful? Um, well, that, what we can do is we can use sampling rate conversion and something called a cascaded integrated comb filter, or CIC. And this is great because what happens is our H of Z, you know, we know this geometric series, right? And we know that there's an integrator and there's a comb involved in both. And what ends up happening is that CIC does not require multiplications or storage of coefficients because it has a beautiful structure, right? It basically has zeros on the unit circle such that it looks like this. And so yeah, zeros on the unit circle. And you also have that integrator as well, the denominator, this guy. So you want to have those two guys together, then you can pull the same trick with the downsampler, the filter, and the integrator. You can move them around to simplify things using that noble identity. And so here's another example. So you can move the interpolator around that comb filter and the upsampler in the very same way. So you can either have interpolator, you can have the comb filter, you can have the integrator, or you can do the switcheroo between the comb filter and the interpolator to have this. So instead of having, so this is the beautiful thing. So instead of having, how many, um, let me just double check. Blah. Instead of having M, M zeros around the unit circle, using the interpolator, moving it using noble identity number two, I just need one zero. And then the interpolator takes care of the rest, right? Does everyone see that? What happens is I go from one minus z to the minus i. So that's root, 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 all along the unit circle. Instead, one minus z to the minus one, one root. And then I interpolate the heck out of it by a factor of i. And then I integrate it. Integrate is also a very easy operation. Boom. Do I need uh, m roots? I just need one. I just need one root. <coughs> Perfect. And then what happens is I can then make a cascade of these guys. So let's say decimation is equal to 8. I can do like a collection of these comb filters, one after another, after another, after another. 
All right. So that's really cool. And then this polyphase representation. So polyphase is really powerful because there are some complexity savings that you can have with respect to polyphase. So um, in a lot of cases, like for instance, you're, you guys are not doing this for your course projects, but with filter banks, there's also a polyphase representation. So if you can have, if you can take, so right now you guys are using QMF filter banks, right? So you're taking a prototype, you're making a, from a low pass, you're making the high pass, and then you're making a tree structure. Another trick is you can rewrite everything in terms of these sort of base components, and then it's just a matter of routing data down the right polyphase contribution to get the exact same thing. So we call that a polyphase filter bank. So you're not doing that for your project, but you sh this is like more like FYI. So what you can do is you can do something like the following. So let's say you want to solve using a polyphase representation with decimators and interpolators, you might want to solve something like this. So let's say you have a decimator, it damp down samples an input signal by a factor of five, and then you use Remez exchange algorithm to determine the coefficients of the FIR filter. So that's parks McLean. And, the, and that, what will that do is that will give us an equi-ripple filter design. In this case, we want a 0.1 dB ripple in the passband, and we want um, it down by at least 3 dB in the stop band. So we want a 30 dB difference between passband ripple and, and, and stop band ripple. And we want you to determine the polyphase filter structure for implementing this guy. So what are the steps? So let's say I give this to you. Let's say you go into industry and someone says, OK, build this, right? And they don't handhold. They just say, ah. So what happens is step one, design your filter. Step two, make polyphase from designed filter. Oh, this sounds great. So what do you do? Part A, use your parks mcleon algorithm. Make your equi-ripple passband and stop-band design using parks mcleon with the fact that you have a passband ripple of 0.1, and you have a stop-band ripple that is 30 dB less than that, right? So what's 30 dB? A thousand times less, right? So you want 0.1 and then divide that by 1,000. That's going to be an extremely small stop-band ripple. Now, from that, um, we also are told, like, you know, so here we have this filter, this low-pass filter, and it's going to have a down sampler after it. So what is the least that I can do in order to make this thing good? Like, we don't have to worry about aliasing. I need, so what happens when we downsample something by 5? The spectrum enlarges by a factor of 5. What should be the cutoff frequency for this low-pass filter? Should be 5, one-fifth of the bandwidth, right? So that's where you get pi over 5. It's one-fifth of the entire filter bandwidth. So from that, all that information, right? So all I tell you is, here's a decimation. Here's the passband ripple. This is how much less the stop band ripple is going to be equal to. Design it for me. Boom. Done. Check. Right? And if it's your job, paycheck too. So then, what we want to do is take this design. So see, here's that thing, the FIRPM. So you get those filter coefficients. Now what you want to do is rearrange your filter coefficients. Ooh, let's draw it. So let's do that. So part A, design filter. And the filter we're going to design is something along the lines of H of n, and then we have down sampler ah, by 5. So what are the requirements? So first of all, passband ripple it's got to be 0.1. Stop band ripple 30 dB less than passband ripple. Okay. What else? Um, since this is used 
with this guy here, 5, need this to have cut off at pi over 5. Otherwise, you have aliasing. Okay? So that's our requirements for the filter. So, and we know that the, we want something equiripple. So let me put that. Equiripple. Therefore, FIRPM, or Parks Methylene. So if you do that, you can accomplish right so this guy is going to be pi over 5 out of pi you have this passband ripple you have a much smaller passband ripple so that's 0.1 that's going to be 0.0001 and so that that's our digital filter to begin with that's going to be our h of n uh, h of Sorry about that. So now, if you got this guy, the next step, part B, is to make the polyphase representation. So we know that H of Z, right, is going to be equal to uh, H naught, Z naught, plus H1, Z, one, uh, Z to the minus 1, plus H2, z to the minus 2, and so on, right? So what we want to do is make polyphase. So in order to accomplish that, what we need to do is we need to, uh, so what sort of polyphase representation? How much do we want to make this a polyphase representation? And what we want to do, so here's the trick. If we're going to be downsampling by 5, because I'm, we're going to be using noble identity number 1, so just a hint. Right? Because we have this structure here. I think what we want, so as a hint, we ultimately want to do something like this, right? We have that. And so what happens to this filter here? Like, you know, what noble identity kicks in, right? So, the, and so the only, what we do is we want a polyphase representation with m equal to 5, because then we can pull this off, right? Okay, so we can keep that for now. So what we do is essentially we subsample that H of n that designs that single filter, that low pass filter we designed with Parks McClellan, and we basically we, su we, we, down we subsample it by a factor of d, and we shift, 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 and that will create our polyphase contributions such that what we end up doing is we go from this guy to this guy. And then by noble identity, go to this guy. All right? So what we're doing is we make this, these polyphase representations, these p naughts, p1s, p2s, and we choose d in this case. So here, d is equal to 3, not d is equal to 5. So let's say d is equal to 3. And what we've got is, first of all, we have these polyphase filters and they're z to the 3, right? What the noble identity tells us is if we move the down sampler to the other side of this, that 3 disappears. Now it's a regular filter. We're not down sampling anything. But it's still identical. And then at the other end, this guy, we use the same thing. We make a polyphase representation. We use a noble identity. And we get that guy. So what do we have? What we essentially have is now our polyphase representations, instead of filtering every third sample, they filter every sample. And, we, and so, 
So think about it. What's happening? Instead of filtering every third sample and then downsampling that third sample and throwing away everything else, I'm being more efficient. I'm downsampling the input to that filter by a factor of three and filtering it sample per sample. So, okay. I can hand wave or I can really educate. So I'm going to educate. Yeah. So let's do this. Because hand waving is fun, but. So what, like, so what happens is what you've got. You have this guy. Let's say it's P0, Z2 to 3. And then you have down sampler by 3. Okay. So how does this look like? So we have input data coming in. And what's happening here is your coefficients are spaced out by h of 0, h of 3, h of 6, h of 9, and so on, right? That's your filter. And, when we, and then what happens is you downsample by 3, you only keep every third guy, and you throw away the rest. And it's like, why am I doing this, right? Oh, and remember that this guy is 0, this guy is 3, this guy is 6. This, so what I'm doing is my filter looks like this. h of 0, 0, 0, 0, um, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. 10, 11, 12, and so on and so forth. So what we're doing is we're convolving. We're, we're taking this guy, convolving him with that, and then downsample by 3. And you know what this tells me? Why am I convolving with zeros? I have 2 thirds of the signal 0. Do I need to convolve with that many zeros? Absolutely not. So what I do, I move the down sampler to the other side. What I do is I take only a third of the data, the data that's going to be kept anyway, and I get rid of the zeros in between each one of the filter coefficients and convolve that. Question? No, just kidding. Like, I see a hand go, no. So what happens is this guy here, what we've got is you can either do brute force convolution and just waste a lot of computational cycles, or you cut your losses. You say, I'm going to only convolve one third of the data because that's what's going to be kept at the end of the day anyway. And that's achieved through the noble identity. And the polyphase, what we're doing is we're taking that single filter because you might wonder, how does this filter work? This same data is then shifted by one sample, right, z to the minus 1. And we do the exact same thing with the next polyphase contribution. So let's do that. So what we're doing, what we're doing, so let's say this is the original data. This is what we're doing. We're taking this guy, this guy, this guy, this guy, this guy, this guy, and this guy. And we're filtering him. So we're only selecting those guys. We get rid of the zeros in between. We filter him with P0 of Z. And then add it with the other guys. So then we take this guy, this guy, this guy, this guy, and him, and him. And maybe there's a guy here too. And we take those guys, filter him with P1 of Z, the next polyphase contribution, and add it there. Then the remaining samples, this guy, this guy, this guy, this guy, this guy, this guy, and this guy. We take those guys, 
filter them with the polyphase uh, filter here, add it, and get that. So what happens is I'm using a third of the coefficients in each one of the polyphase filters. I take a third of the data, filter them with a third of the coefficients for each polyphase. Note that they're delayed by each, so I'm sampling a certain one with an offset, sum them together, and that gives me the equivalent filter output as H of Z. It's wonderful polyphase. And the exact opposite happens when we use it the other way around with interpolators. It's wonderful. Keep. All right. So, you know, there's more information about this in section 11.5.5. So, you know, you're all encouraged to read that. But really, again, the, um, home, the, the problem set has a few of these. Try it out. This is really cool, powerful stuff. So if you ever go into advanced DSP, like ECE 630, or anything to do with like uh, filter banks, this comes out with a vengeance. This is everywhere because it saves computational cycles galore. All right? So with that, that concludes lecture 26 of ECE 503. Okay. So, you know, we...